Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome back to the POMEPS Conversation series of discussions with leading scholars in the field. With me today is Kaveh Asani of DePaul University, and uh, today we're going to be talking about Iran. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Kaveh, you, got, you have a broader historical perspective on Iranian politics than uh, certainly than I do. And uh, so I thought a good place to start our conversation might be with a comparison between mm. the last reformist president and the current one. Mm -hmm. So in broad strokes, how would you compare the presidency of, uh, of Rouhani with uh, Mohammed Khatami? Uh, well, uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, Khatami basically uh, started a um, new trend in Iranian politics by directly appealing to uh, layers of society that uh, had been more or less uh, kind of marginalized or excluded from, uh, from politics. Uh, mostly young people, uh, women, intellectuals, uh, many of these urban, uh, educated people who had uh, university degrees and so on. He tried to mobilize uh, these various layers of uh, society to support his reformist project. So it was kind of a limited and rather elitist uh, project, but it became extremely popular because he was really challenging the uh, rather limited uh, and established uh, form of uh, politics in, in that had prevailed in Iran until then. Um, he attempted to mobilize uh, various sections of society for his, in support of his political project, uh, but these attempts at the mobilization were remained rather limited because he was afraid to antagonize uh, the ruling establishment too much. Uh, so he gave a free reign to the press to an unprecedented degree, so a lot of uh, independent newspapers came forth. They really kind of uh, managed to establish a uh, uh, a new form of public discourse in, in Iran that really energized uh, uh, various segments of society. It was really uh, liberating. He really kind of relied on students as his foot soldiers, university students that is. Um, he uh, really um, uh, encouraged uh, artists and allocated a lot of budget to filmmakers and uh, musicians and so on and so forth. So, Culturally and uh, socially, he kind of uh, uh, opened up uh, the Iranian polity to an unprecedented degree, and he did carry out a certain le levels of uh, social mobilization. Beyond that, to challenge the um, established uh, political order, uh, instead of confronting it, he thought that he could implement uh, segments of the Iranian constitution that had been laid dormant uh, since 1979, namely uh, electing local officials for councils, urban councils and provincial councils and rural councils. Uh, so in, I think it was 1999 or 2000, he, he managed to force through uh, these vast elections that brought in about 120,000 elected local officials uh, that were elected by, without going through the usual filter of the Guardian Council in Iran. Uh, so they were really independent, the first independently elected uh, officials after the revolution. Um, but Khatami thought that uh, this would really kind of change the nature of the balance of power politically in Iran. Uh, in fact, it didn't because these local councils um, were not very well thought through. I mean, there, there was, uh, you know, they were part of the uh, constitution, but the, 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 the levels of their authority remained unclear, you know, what kind of budget they had what kind of rules they could uh, implement, what, you know, what uh, role they had, what kind of authority they had over appointed officials and so on and so forth. So they became, these councils over time very quickly became factionalized or became bureaucratized and they couldn't carry out any sort of mandate for opening up and democratizing and, or pluralizing politics in Iran. Rather they became tangled in bickering and so on and so forth and they did not become very effective. So. Khatami did pay attention to political mobilization in society. Uh, part of his uh, attempts failed. Uh, he, and he basically did not go even near uh, allowing political part, independent political parties or trade unions and associations to come into being. Uh, so he was partially successful in this sort of building a an organized political mass. Uh, uh, in Iran. But then in the end his failure was because he didn't carry out these political reforms all the way through. 
Rohani, on the other hand, comes from a very different background. He, his background, he was the head of the National Security Agency. He's always been uh, an unelected member of the ruling establishment. He's uh, very close to the military and intelligence communities. Uh, so he's a fighter, he, you know, he's not intimidated as easily as intellectuals are by, you know, implicit threats, by uh, these uh, apparatuses of, uh, of coercion. But on the other hand, he's not a particularly firm believer in social mobilization either. Uh, he hasn't taken any steps to legalize political parties. Uh, but on the other hand, he has, he has taken some positive steps in uh, supporting, in appointing reformers to some key ministries, uh, for example, higher education or housing uh, or labor in particular, who've been a little bit more um, kind or tolerant toward uh, uh, various forms of uh, social discontent, for, for example, labor strikes and all that. Uh, but he hasn't gone far enough. And I think this is his, really his flaw. Uh, the, you know, whether, and this is the question we have to pose, uh, whether Rouhani would be willing to uh, really go uh, further step and allow the mobilization and establishment of political parties and trade unions and associations or not. Do, do you think that he wants to? Uh, do you think that ultimately he has reformist intentions or mm. is he simply a creature of the establishment uh, basically mm. just finding ways to reconstitute an existing power yeah. structure? Uh, it's a, this is a good question. Um, I think, yes, they're all creatures of the establishment in some ways. You know, they've been men, you know, men of politics of the Islamic Republic, uh, like Khatami, like Rafsanjani, like Ahmadinejad even. Uh, but the question is, how does he see the, how does he foresee the survival and improvement and consolidation of the Islamic Republic? So he's a strategist, you know, he's a, he's a jurist, he's a strategist, he's thinking along those lines and he's kind of evaluating what would be good for a political system that he believes in, but he thinks that is also flawed and needs a significant improvement and is under threat right now. So the question is, you know, what, what will be, you know, what will be he be evaluating uh, in the near future? One of the things is that he's a character who for the first time came to power through elections, so he has that, ma his political mandate comes from people voting for him. But then these people have very clear uh, demands uh, from this polity. People are really disillusioned and they have expectations for economic improvement and for having a voice in politics. And that voice in politics can't come th only through proxy anymore. It has to come through representation and I think that's the next step that Rouhani has to seriously think about. Uh, you know, what, in what ways can he uh, bring forth the possibility of people being able to represent themselves? So Let's say the nuclear talks succeed or fail, sanctions are lifted or not lifted. Mm -hmm. Who benefits from that, uh, from either the success or the failure? Does, does, would it rebound mm -hmm. to Rouhani's benefit if they succeeded and sanctions yeah. were lifted? Or are domestic politics largely independent yeah. of uh, the, the negotiations that consume Washington's yeah. attention? Uh, no, they're not independent. But it's a, it's a very um, highly factionalized uh, polity, right? So there are many sections within, the, for example, the establishment, the military establishment, that highly benefit from the sanctions. They have a monopoly through um, uh, you know, uh, contraband through working the black economy to their own benefit. Uh, they don't want to give up that, uh, that, that power. There's a n large section of the ruling establishment uh, that really will come under threat if the economy and the, and the politics are normalized. Uh, because they basically operate in these shady areas where they get uh, bidding contracts for, you know, without you know, going through the due process. Uh, or they work on intimidating the members of opposition. You know, they're basically brute force, they're used as brute force. Uh, a lot of people uh, ha have their positions thanks to patronage and all that, which will come under question if, you know, normal standards are imposed in universities, in offices, in, uh, in various institutions. Uh, they will face a much more competitive atmosphere if the sanctions are lifted. On the other hand, the sanctions have brought us to a point where there is a serious significant external threat of warfare that nobody wants. And secondly, that the economy is really on the verge of bankruptcy. So the whole system is under serious threat of, you know, uh, for, for its survival. 
And that is something that they have to kind of balance and weigh. And so there's this battle going on within the ruling establishment. So, so for the IRGC, uh, for their selfish interest, they might prefer to keep the sanctions, but mm. they can see that the sanctions are bringing the whole system down. Yeah. So they, they're torn. They're torn. I mean, you know, that's the really, you know, I mean, that, you know, there's this view of IRCG that it's just a mafia structure. It's not. It's a calculating military structure that whose aim is to preserve, you know, they're called the guardians of the revolution. They want to preserve the system. How do you preserve the system? Do they think only short term that, uh, you know, they should enrich their own pockets or their allies and uh, rule just through sheer force? Or they realize that this is a politicized society that can at some point overthrow them or challenge them significantly as they did the monarchy and the Shah. So they're making those calculations. So there are parts of them that are really have become really corrupted. But the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Republican, I mean, the Revolutionary Guards are highly factionalized within them. And there's a lot of debate and disagreement over what course to pursue. Interesting. Um, be before we wrap up, I need to ask you about the, the most important thing which happened in Iran this summer, of course, the World Cup. Uh -huh. um, so the, the, the success or the, I, I think it's fair to say the success of, of, of the football team, does it have, how does that resonate with Iranian politics and society? Is it good for Rouhani that the World uh -huh. Cup was such a success for Iran, or how, how does that play out? Um, I, I didn't think they were successful. Okay. I, th I thought, you know, they've played in, what, we've played in four World Cups, and the only victory that our team has had was over the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> that was a success. <laughs> Otherwise, they've either well, but they, they, were, or, they were playing Argentina. It's, they uh, were playing Argentina. If they had beaten Argentina, then, yeah. It would and have they came considered. awfully close. They came awfully close, but then they fell short. I think, look, it's a good question because I think, you know, football really kind of reflects uh, politics in, in, a, in bizarre ways nowadays. Um, I think the Iranian national team highly underachieved. They have, you know, soccer has tremendous potential in Iran. Everybody's aware of it. Everybody's really into it. And they know how underachieving it's been. You know, the great athletes, uh, great skills, great potential, but total failure in the end because, you know, they... You know, they didn't even qualify to go up. You know, it, it, is, it wasn't improvement over, it wasn't an improvement over the previous participation, right? <clears throat> and that really is the frustration that uh, everybody feels that, okay, we can do a lot better. Why aren't we doing any, any better? And we shouldn't be happy with, with this level of performance, even though it wasn't a disgrace. So losing to a messy miracle isn't enough. Um, uh, you know, we should have beaten Bosnia because we had beaten them before, so <laughs> let's leave it at that. All right, thanks. Kaveh Asani of DePaul University, thanks for joining My us. My pleasure.